um, getting... So, um, great to be here this afternoon. I first met um, Chris, I think, about six months ago, and he came to talk. Everyone was telling us that, that the John Lewis partnership should be in healthcare. Um, and um, so uh, we thought, um, we asked Chris to kind, kind of come along and talk to, to the, uh, my executive team. And uh, after he did, we decided you'll be pleased or disturbed to hear that uh, really healthcare was far too difficult. We'll stick with running shops. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, but uh, perhaps more, more seriously, I think um, yeah, what, uh, what I really want to say is that uh, I, you know, we as an organisation uh, are very, I certainly am very aware that uh, what we do is we run shops, we run a retail business, and you know, I'm proud of that business, uh, I'm a great advocate for that business. Um, I'm also pleased that there's a lot of interest uh, in our employee ownership model, because I also believe that that's got real potential and relevance. Um, and you know, we've, we've had this model for about 80 years, and we're probably hitting a bit of a purple patch right now in terms of sort of interest uh, in it. Um, but there's, a, there's never such thing as a sort of an entirely good or an entirely bad thing, although I think my, Ian might challenge that. Um, <laughs> and, and while I'm a huge advocate for employee ownership, I'm also very strongly of the view that it is not a panacea, uh, that absolutely it's not the case that applying ownership, a different ownership model to a situation will suddenly magically make that situation wonderfully easy and sort of solve all these intractable problems that uh, organisations often, ha often have to fight their way through. Um, and I'm certainly uh, very strongly of the view that, that I know very little about healthcare and certainly not how to run many of the organisations that, uh, that you, uh, you do. Um, but, um, but I do think, as I said, that, that uh, people uh, is something that we all have in common. And in a way, what uh, Wai Yin was talking about and the importance of leadership uh, and the way that culture plays such an important part in that, uh, all because it focuses on the people in the organisation, is hugely, hugely important. And it ultimately determines uh, the success uh, of any organisation. Uh, and I think that we in the partnership are very fortunate because we have an ownership model and a structure and lots of other things that we work quite hard at, which really serve to reinforce the focus on culture and on people all the time, rather than focusing sometimes on the outcomes of, of profit or sales, which are very important. Uh, but uh, we very much focus on the, on the means uh, and the ends. Uh, hopefully, if we get things right, usually uh, come out uh, about right. Now, um, I've been asked to talk about um, uh, risk, reward, and motivation, and um, that's sort of pretty big subjects. And I, I think if uh, if you had the, the graveyard slot, I think I must be in Hades or something <laughs> at this stage, at this stage of the afternoon. So rather than sort of going into something incredibly sort of theoretical and uh, and boring, I thought I would start off by um, by by actually just talking briefly about a visit I did the other day. I, I get round the partnership quite a bit, and I was um, in uh, a Waitrose distribution centre down in Aylesford in Kent. Uh, and uh, it's a place that we bought from uh, one of our competitors a little while back, and uh, we took on a lot of the people who had been working in that distribution centre. And, uh, and I can tell you, a grocery distribution centre is not a glamorous place. You know, people have to move stuff from A to B. They have to do it under you know, quite a lot of pressure, quite quickly, often in the middle of the night. Sometimes it, you, know, you work for eight hours in a fridge with a big coat on all the time. So this is not uh, a glamorous place uh, to work. Um, but it's a very, very important part of our business. And, and uh, I always like going to parts of our organisation that have recently joined us because sometimes you meet people and you can talk to them and you can say, look, help, you know, tell me what it's like actually in the partnership. Uh, I'm always a bit suspicious because when I hove interview, they normally know I'm coming and there's sometimes a sort of smell of, 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 of new paint. But you've got these people who you can say, right, tell me what the real difference is. You know, I'm not interested in hearing how it's meant to be or what you think you should say. Tell me what the real difference is. Uh, and I was um, in Aylesford and I was talking to uh, a chap called Nigel, who's a driver, drives our, uh, our, some of our vehicles around, uh, delivering to shops in that, uh, in that area and really all across the southeast. Uh, and I said to him, look, Nigel, tell, I, I really want to understand what the difference is. And he sort of thought for a moment, and I thought, crikey, you know, this, was this a sort of an embarrassing question? And then he came out with the most fantastically simple answer, which captured actually what the partnership is really all about. And what he said to me, he said, the difference is that now, here, I'm asked to do things. And when I was working for the previous owners, I was told. And, I've, uh, you know, and, and I thought about that for a moment. I said, well, tell me a bit more about this. And he described, well, in the last organization, we have a heavily unionized uh, organization. The management uh, you know, would have some objectives they needed to achieve. 
uh, and they would just simply say, right, we're going to issue with a statutory notice of variation of a contract or something. We've got, you know, the, the rules say we have to give you 21 days notice. The unions would then say, well, that's not very fair and you haven't taken account of our things and you'd be immediately into a conflict situation. And instead, he said, here, I'm asked to do things. And I'll just expand a little bit on this, because actually what he was really, in a wonderfully simple way, as I said, putting his finger on is, is some of the things that we work very, very hard at. We were founded um, uh, by a chap called Speed and Lewis, whose father set up the shop uh, in, uh, in Oxford Street and was an out-and-out -out capitalist. He was not interested in all this sort of fluffy, sort of different way of doing business stuff. And he had a young son, who, who was about 22, who thought that well, the world could be a bit different. And this was in about 1905. And I won't give you the full story, but basically after uh, <coughs> Speedon's father died, Speedon Lewis then uh, turned the John Lewis partnership into an employee-owned business. Uh, and he did this in two tranches over 25 years. But really what he was seeking to do was to establish an organisation which was founded on a principle of fairness. Uh, and the, the vehicle for delivering that was ownership. And what he talked about was the importance of employees, owners as they became, having rights of ownership but also having responsibilities. And I'll just talk briefly about the rights, because there were three, uh, and they're incredibly uh, relevant even today, 80, 90 years on. Um, and they were a right to have knowledge. So if you're an owner of a business, if it's your business, you would write, you'd have a right to know how it was doing. And if you think about Nigel, you know, in the case of what he was talking to me about, he was talking about the fact that they had changed some of the delivery routes, and it meant changing contracts and hours, and when people started and when they finished. Uh, and what Nigel knew, because there's a lot of knowledge that he'd, been sh he'd, he'd received from the organisation, because we share lots and lots and lots of information, um, was that actually that was necessary, because the way the trading patterns had changed in the shops, and a few things had happened here, and a few things had happened there, meant that clearly the delivery rounds that we were doing weren't optimal, and they needed to change. So Nigel had knowledge, uh, just because we'd simply provided it. And we, in our organisation, give a lot of information to our people. I, I would hope, and you can put this to the test probably, but if you go to our, our shop over the road uh, and you ask someone there you know, how they're doing, how we're doing, hopefully they will know uh, not only uh, how the shop is doing, but certainly how their particular part of the shop is doing, because that information is available to everybody uh, literally all the time. They can press a code on the till and they can print out a, a thing and tell you how much money they've taken in that department uh, in the, the day uh, so far and at any, any moment. Uh, so knowledge is very, very important, and it's a fundamental right of, of, own, of an owner of a business to know how uh, you're doing. The second right of ownership uh, was to share power, uh, and uh, there's quite a lot to that, so I'll just simplify it. And essentially, the power that uh, perhaps one of the most important powers that exists for partners in our organisation is that they can sack the chairman. So the only way the chairman can be fired is if a, an elected group of councillors, as we call them, 70 of them, uh, say, we think the chairman's not doing a good enough job leading our business and we, we vote that uh, he or she should be removed from office. Now, I have to say that's never happened yet. I'm glad to say. I hope it won't. <laughs> but the significance is um, that I am accountable to partners. Now, so instead of them working for me, I actually work for them. And beyond that, the greatest significance is not what happens at the top of the organisation, these 70 people, because there's 76,000 people in our organisation, but in every single partnership, John Lewis partnership uh, branch, shop, for Waitrose shops, so with one round the corner of Marlborough High Street in the John Lewis shop here, there is also an elected group uh, of uh, councillors or, or partners. Uh, and those people can't sack the manager. Uh, because if they could, then I couldn't do my job of running the business because I'd suddenly find that a whole load of my managers have been sacked without me knowing about it. But they are required to go to that group. They can be asked any questions by those people. And essentially what they're doing is those, those partners know that they can hold their boss to account for how they are running their part of the business. And so the relationship that I've described that I have differently, I think, to a lot of organisations with partners, which is that I work for them, not the other way around, is actually mirrored at every, organi every level through the whole organisation. And it's an absolutely essential part of the way uh, that we run the business. It means that when people are making decisions, they're thinking, because uh, they have to make decisions, and leaders lead in our organisation. We don't manage by committee. But they know that when they make a decision, they're going to be accountable to the people that it will affect. And so they think very carefully about the impact and about how to handle that. And then the third uh, 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 right of ownership is to share uh, profit. 
and uh, what we do is we share profits in our organization every year. Uh, it's quite a high profile thing on our results day. Uh, at 9.30 in the morning you won't be able to, or just after 9.30 you will be able to get through the door, but not before because everyone in the shop will be assembled around, usually in the central atrium. Uh, and then the partner, maybe the, the youngest one or the most one re recently joined or someone's birthday or the longest serving, somebody in the shop will be chosen to open an envelope. Uh, and on results day, it's the most eagerly awaited moment because inside that envelope is a number. And it's a number which is a, a percentage of pay. Uh, and what it is, it's the percentage of pay that everybody will get in the organization from the chairman to the person who's most recently joined Waitrose. Uh, and it's that percentage that everyone gets throughout the whole organization. And it's an amount of money which we distribute. We distribute roughly half of our profits each year to our partners. And sometimes it goes up if we have a good year and sometimes it goes down. And everybody understands that. Uh, but it's a very important part of, our, uh, of, uh, of, of sharing uh, the benefits of ownership, uh, but also the way we do it, which is transparent and is fair, not equal, mind you, but fair, uh, is also very important. So when I come back to Nigel again, and I say, well, so think about the ask versus told. Hopefully what you can see is, you know, Nigel understood why we needed to make a change. Because of the, the, the right to share power, actually Nigel probably also had been asked by his manager uh, rather than just simply told. And actually, he would also understand that it was in his interest, because what we're trying to do is make our business more efficient. And so there was a sort of virtuous cycle there uh, that kicked in. And for him, it just came down to being asked, not told. Now, those are the rights of ownership. But of course, with rights become, come some responsibilities. Uh, and, and really, very simply, the responsibility that everyone in our organization has is not just to do their job, but actually to do their job better every single day. Uh, and that's what we try to sort of instill in our people. And in an organization of 76,000 people, where it's you know, moving things from A to B, selling things, doing lots of, a whole myriad of different tasks, actually that's a very strong competitive advantage. Uh, and it's one that works incredibly well and is very important to us. Now, uh, what I would um, uh, stress is that I don't think what I've described is unique to the John Lewis partnership. Some pieces may be, you know, our ownership model as such may be uh, a little bit unusual and not widely shared. Um, but I've been to lots of organizations where I see flashes of this, including actually some uh, within uh, the NHS. And I, was, uh, I visited uh, a, a stroke and community care unit in Swindon uh, a, uh, a few months ago, back. And I was talking to a sister who was running a ward. And she was telling me very enthusiastically about how the number of, um, of, of bed nights um, that her ward had achieved was the best that they'd achieved for, for the last three years. And most importantly, it was better than the one upstairs. So she knew that. She had that knowledge. You know, very naturally, because you know, human beings are sort of competitive, uh, she understood what success looked like and she was motivated to try and do it. We went on a little wander around the ward and then she, she again went on to show me uh, the absence figures in the, in the ward and they'd started to publish those with their staff, sharing what the figures were. And she sort of pointed out to me the point at which where they started to publish these figures, the before, the absence levels, and the after. And hey presto, they'd fallen off. So the power of knowledge, I think, is very, very uh, evident there. And then we went round to a storeroom and what she showed me there was that um, a, a member of her staff had written the price per unit price of, on all the different items in the storeroom uh, so that when a uh, member of her staff was using an item, actually they could make an informed choice about whether they use something uh, that costs five pounds a unit or three pounds a unit or 50 pence a unit and whether they use one, two, three or four of them. Uh, and simply by providing that information, again, they'd save some money. Uh, they hadn't seen any deterioration in patient care. Uh, but they had enabled and empowered their people to make informed choices. And so what I saw there, it's just a small example, but I saw lots of flashes which immediately resonated with me and say to me that, you know, what I've described to you is not in any way, in, a lot of it isn't unique at all uh, to the John Lewis partnership. It's actually alive and well in your organizations prob probably, uh, and it's certainly very possible uh, in lots and lots of other places. Um, I'll um, say a brief word about, uh, about change because I think, uh, you know, in the NHS, a lot of organizations are going through a lot of change. Change is a sort of common feature of life, is my view. It's never, it's never the case that we're not dealing with change. Um, but um, in our organization, we've also had to face really significant change. And I've described you know, Nigel and the ask versus tell. And there's a sort of danger sometimes that you can, I can give you the impression that somehow it's a sort of protected group of you know, where everything is wonderful and people sort of always nice to each other and we haven't ha don't ever have to do difficult things. Um, but instead, the truth is that actually we have had to do difficult things in the John Lewis partnership. In fact, in the last three years, one in eight partners <coughs> working in John Lewis has been in a redundant, potentially redundant position. 
Uh, and very recently, we've had to drive a big, big change through our Waitrose organization uh, about of about 3,000 management positions. Um, we realized that we had about 600 more than we could afford or need and that needed in the long run uh, in the current structure. Uh, and so these are very big numbers and they're very big changes. And, and what we have done there is we've gone about uh, change. We've tried to go about change in a way which reflects uh, our values, reflects the rights and the responsibilities of ownership. And we've tried to move towards a position of, instead of being very paternalistic, which I have to say we used to be very, very paternalistic in our organisation, and, and really you know, the responsibility that partners would put on the management was to make change smooth and almost unnoticeable. Uh, we've moved to a position where we're trying to be much more adult with our people and being very, very clear with them about why we need to change, uh, you know, the, 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 all the reasons and the consideration that goes around that and sharing that very openly with people. Uh, and then actually creating a situation where people can take responsibility for their own uh, outcomes and their own futures. Uh, and often what that requires is for managers to realise that your job is not to dive in and save the day, uh, but it is actually to nurture and to support people who are going through a difficult time uh, and provide them with a framework which allows them to engage in thinking about what the future may hold. We also, uh, I think, are very fortunate in that our model allows us to make decisions about what the timescales should be for things like this. You know, we don't have to do it faster or slower than you know, anybody other than what suits the partnership and suits the partners within it. And therefore, what we've done is chosen, in some cases, particularly the one about Waitrose I mentioned, to take two years to affect this change. But in so doing, uh, actually what we will be able to achieve is we'll probably lose hardly any of those managers, the 600 who are currently uh, greater than requirements. And instead, we're actually providing people with a lot of support to move into alternative positions, which means that we'll not only retain their experience and their ability within the partnership, we'll actually won't have destroyed trust, and actually we will have saved a lot of money because we won't frankly have made, had to make lots of people redundant at very, very high cost. Uh, and had to go through all the pain and then the recovery uh, from that. So I just wanted to sort of give you a sort of brief, brief sort of perhaps a brief, uh, brief hint at, uh, at that. So um, for, the, for the public sector, does this have relevance? Well, I think, um, I hope, you know, some of what I've said has struck a bit of a chord with you and you can see uh, where it might, uh, might have uh, some relevance. As I've said, I don't believe um, that uh, ownership is a panacea. I don't think that bestowing ownership on you know, at the NHS or different, or the Royal Mail, for that matter, or anything else, is going to magically uh, fix all these, uh, these situations or make them wonderful places. What I do believe is there is enormous power from empowering people, uh, from really making sure that your leadership effort is focused on your people uh, and, and in encouraging and enabling them to perform as best as they can possibly be. Uh, and indeed creating some uh, uh, alignment and reinforcement from all the other things that go on with your, within your organisation to support that all the time and encouraging your people to feel a really powerful sense of ownership and responsibility for doing a great job. And most people who, in my experience, or very few people in my experience, go to work to do a bad job. And I would imagine that in, in the NHS, above almost every organisation, they definitely don't do that. In fact, they go with all the right motivations, with a deep-seated care uh, for the patients that they're looking to care for, to look after and make better and improve their lives. Uh, and actually, sometimes I believe that you know, the great sadness is that some of the things that we have to deal with in the wider world uh, can force us occasionally uh, to, uh, to erode some of that rather than nurture it. And I think the great job and the great opportunity of leadership in any organisation uh, is actually to give people uh, that sense of purpose and opportunity to perform as well as they possibly can. And ultimately, that's, from that comes uh, fulfilment. Okay, thank you very much, Charlie. <laughs> right, sir.